Hello. Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for making it here um, so early on the first slot of this being the second day officially of the IGF 23. My name is Hendrik Eich. I'm a public affairs officer at Géant, which is the regional research and education network of Europe. Um, and before I introduce the speakers, I'd like to just talk a little bit about why we're here today. So global cooperation in the field of submarine cables is an essential element of both internet governance and diplomacy. Research and educational activity is fueling demands to support investments in submarine systems in remote areas as well as in more traditional routes. The changing profile of the ownership slash utilization of the internet is noted and the public interest role of research and education can be seen to be significant enough to be a conduit to ensure a retention of an open, resilient and distributed internet structure. Submarine cable agreements between national regional research and education networks, or NRENs slash RENs, are based on the common values of trust and reciprocity, and they allow public entities to not just share and disseminate public research, educational data, but innovate solutions and services to bolster scientific advancement. With this, of course, comes both economic growth and drivers of sustainability. Submarine cables can also provide physical geopolitical solutions to an increasingly politicized internet for the good of research and education. Um, I'd like to now introduce the speakers uh, we have today for you. Uh, the first, and this will be in order of appearance. So the first is my colleague, Paul Rouse. He's the Chief Community Relations Officer at Géon, and he's joining us uh, online, and he'll be presenting first. Um, following that, uh, we have our friends and colleagues from, from WIDE, so starting with Jun Marai-san, founder of the WIDE Project, uh, professor at Keio University Graduate School, oh sorry, professor at Keio University and father of the Japanese internet. We then have Professor Kaiko Okawa-san, and she's a professor at the Keio University Graduate School of Media Design. She's a director of the School on the Internet Asia Project, launched by the WIDE Project in 2001. And then we have Dr. Masafumi Oe-san, is a vice director of the IT security office at the National Astronomical Observatory of Japan. And our final speaker will be Ieva Mureshkeni. She's a strategy and policy officer at Norginet, which is the regional network for the Scandinavian um, NRENs. Um, the backdrop of this um, session is um, we wanted to view it a bit through the lens of the EU-Japan strategic partnership and also Within that agreement between the EU and Japan, there are provisions for agreements on submarine cables. And in order to understand this in its scientific, economic, and um, political impact, um, we'll start with Jean giving a brief overview of how we came to this space. And with that, I'd like to hand over to Paul for his first 20 minutes. Thank you, Hendrik, and good morning to everybody there and to all those online. Can you see and hear me okay? okay? Good, thank you. Right, we'll start then with the first slide. And uh, really, I'd like to start off with an introduction um, here to talk about how the how we have the outcome of the combination of submarine cables, the internet, and research and education networks. So we'll start today with a little lesson in history, first of all. And uh, let's look at the, the concept of the submarine cable. It was in the mid 19th century when the first transatlantic cable was put into service. Um, it started off with another very successful beginning, but by 1988, the world saw the advent of fiber optic cables in place across the North Atlantic as well. And this really became the start of the capabilities as we know today, to the point where 98, 99% of all the world's internet traffic is actually carried by submarine cables. And there to the right, you can see uh, an extract of all the submarine cables that are in service around the world. So really very much a critical infrastructure for modern society. Let's overlay that next then with how the internet came about. So it was Vint Cerf back uh, at Stanford University and the importance here of the story here is you, you'll see that uh, a lot of the internet was born out of research academia. So Stanford University, 
the internet protocol uh, was devised. And then later on at CERN, Sir Tim Berners-Lee actually came up with the concept of the World Wide Web. Now, many of you may have heard of the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, where at the lowest level, humans recognize we have the need for simple things like food, warmth, shelter. Some bright individual has repurposed this Maslow's hierarchy of need and suggested Wi-Fi is the most important characteristic in modern society. So it just goes to show from the concept of, of ideas in research that the internet now is ingrained in everything we do. And for any of you that have young children, you'll know anywhere you go someone new, the first thing they want to do is find out the code for the Wi-Fi. Looking at the next slide then, What's the significance of, of research and, and the use of, of the Internet? Well, here in the image, you can see uh, the Atlas experiment at CERN in Geneva. Uh, the purpose of CERN is high energy physics, and it looks for new, exciting uh, research into how the world was created. So most recently, you would have heard of a new particle that had been identified, the Higgs boson particle. And when the scientists there work on these uh, activities, the, re the, the experiments are conducted there, but the data is disseminated around the world for scientists to collaborate globally to investigate those data sets. And uh, what you can see on that bottom graph on this slide is actually the increase and in the profile of traffic. These scientists generate huge amounts of data when they conduct these experiments. And what you'll actually see on the right hand side of that graph is where the traffic is now or the data produced flowing out of the, the network to research around the world is actually starting to peak at around a terabit of data that's coming out there. So in terms of networking connectivity, that's a pretty significant flow rate in the network. And we need so a certain kind of network capabilities and solutions to be able to convey and transmit that data accurately. As well as this, CERN produces other great impacts on all of our lives. Uh, a picture there of an X-ray so the technologies that CERN are working with are actually then deployed and adopted in X-ray technology that many of us, hopefully, you won't experience it. But if you go into hospital and have a, an X-ray taken, some of the technology from CERN may be incorporated into the X-ray machines that are used to improve the, the image definition. So that's physical sciences, but that's not the only place where network connectivity is important. In the subject of observing the Earth, Earth environmental sciences, the European Union has a space program called Copernicus. Copernicus has a number of satellites that have different sensors there. And all of these sensors take a range of measurements around the Earth and make this data set available for researchers around the world. So as an example here, one such center in Kenya, the Regional Center for Mapping of Resources for Development, receives this data that's uh, gathered from the satellites and is transmitted over research and education networks for researchers to help contribute towards the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, looking at land use, um, crop erosion, uh, crop diseases, all of the sensing technologies are very important to help make effective use of land resources. Now, if you recall back to what I told you about the creation of the internet, roughly at the time the internet was created was also the birth of the National Research and Education Networks. And I'd now like to introduce you to the Jeanne organization. Hendrik mentioned it briefly in his introduction, and I'll, I'll spend a little bit more time here. Jeanne is based in the Netherlands, but we're an association with 39 member NRENs behind us. And we provide services and activities that support over 10,000 institutions or 50 million academic users. So we're pretty significant in terms of research and education activity. And in our composition and our activities, the things that we cover and do, if we look at the next slide, please, Hendrik, is in running that organisation, we undertake a number of European funded projects. But in doing this, we have three dimensions, the network, services and people. The network I'll talk about more in just a moment, but the services are also important to exploit that network technology layer. So identity services, allowing students to access their resources as they move around uh, centres uh, or researchers to collaborate uh, using shared facilities. And then finally, the people dimension, ensuring communities of interest can collaborate and work effectively. And the way the modern world works, 
this isn't limited just to Europe. We often work on a global basis. Let's have a little bit of a look at the network now. The network that you can see there isn't built by Jean alone. A characteristic of our community, the National Research and Education Network, or that when it's aggregated at a regional level, the Regional Education Network, we collaborate together. So Europe will collaborate with North America, with Asia PAC, to ensure a network is in place to support those use cases that I've described already. And my colleagues and speakers here today will talk to you at greater length about some of the specific activities or initiatives that we see coming up in the future. But at present, we have a good infrastructure to ensure this collaboration and this research activity can happen. We not only support the physical sciences and the earth sciences, but we support other user communities as well. Research often relies on technology artificial intelligence, high performance computing infrastructure, access to those sorts of resources are important. Our network provides the connectivity pathways to those. But also the control that we have over our network infrastructure ensures that we can service arts and humanities community who are very sensitive to latency characteristics on a network, such that a, an artist performing a dance routine in Latin America can collaborate with someone in Central Europe who may be playing the accompanying music with a very much controlled latency over the music and image coordination. Health and food uh, is another area and also uh, energy. Uh, we're working on developing a, a new site in Cadarache in France where there is a global collaboration to look at fusion uh, energy sources. Um, the data and control of those systems will produce a significant amount of uh, connectivity requirements and research and education networks are underpinning that. So I've explained to you a little bit about how the internet came to be, how it has its source in research education, and also the significance of submarine cables that, in, that, in that domain. So what have we done about this? What have we done as research and education networks to make sure that the network and infrastructure exists there? Well, as an example, Red Clara, the regional network in Latin America with Jayon and funding from the European Commission enabled an investment in a new submarine cable connecting Europe to Latin America, such that we have dedicated spectrum on this route for the use and benefit of research and education networks. So this was a real pathfinder example how research and education networks can be an active player in the submarine cable marketplace. That's a little bit about the now. What about the future? Well, why are we here talking today? What's important to us? If we look to an external advice, um, that from Telegeography, uh, a good expert organization in understanding all things that are going on about connectivity in large, their data shows that the ownership of these submarine cables is changing. It's changing that what are called content providers, the likes of Google, Microsoft, Facebook, are taking a greater percentage ownership in this submarine cable infrastructure, which means the market is shrinking. So we perhaps have a risk around ensuring that we have adequate capacities that we can continue as NRENs to could deliver the research and education mission. So this is taking our attention and we're seeing some action and response to this already. In Europe, on the next slide, there is an initiative called the Digital Data Gateways. Just recently, Jean has worked with the European Investment Bank and DG Near from the EC to invest in a new uh, Medusa submarine cable system in the Mediterranean Sea. And this will improve the connectivity for a number of North African countries. There's another example where, for the benefit of research and education and securing sovereignty over this infrastructure for the public good, we can have a good mix in the parties and actors to ensure continued outcomes and, and uh, infrastructure access. But it's not just the connectivity. As a community, the research element continues. And we're using these same submarine cables in a new project called Submerse to investigate whether it's possible 
to use submarine cables to be earth observing. And on the next slide, you'll see an overview of the Submerse project. Ooh, one slide appears to have, have missed out there. So I'll just talk to that. The submarine cable has the ability to not only ca carry data, that research data that may be produced by CERN, but it has the ability to observe the earth around it. And the oceans are the largest, greatest unexplored territory. So we can see what's happening to the earth from the view of the ocean, which is important for things like climate change and understanding undersea currents. So we're looking at how these submarine cables can also be used for earth observation. I mentioned earlier uh, when I was talking about the network, how we don't ever do this just alone. We always ensure that we collaborate with partners around the world. And often at a political level, we see commitments being made. For example, between Europe and Japan, with a recently signed strategic partnership agreement. And I know Jun will talk to this more uh, shortly and explain how we can translate this political agreement into action in the form of things like digital connectivity and the broader socio-economic benefits that that brings. So overall, there's an introduction there. I hope you've understood how the internet has come to be, how the importance of submarine cables are relevant to the internet in carrying that majority of all traffic and how for research and education it is essential that we can continue to have access to submarine connectivity infrastructure to deliver the benefits for society at large. Thank you very much for uh, listening and uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of the session. Thank you Hendrik. Thank you very much Paul um, and thank you very much for that clear introduction as to why these cables matter essentially for research and education in our community at large. Um, before I move on, does anybody have any questions for Paul from the audience or in the chat, which I see no questions. Um, we can also, we also have a segment at the end where we have time for more audience questions. Um, but now I would now like to move on to WIDE, our colleagues in Japan. And um, I see Jun has a microphone already. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so okay. I will let him start. All right. Uh, th thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to Kyoto, Japan. And uh, um, I'm uh, uh, Jun Rai, uh, Kyoto University Wide Project, well, founder of a Wide Project. Uh, and uh, I'm going to talk about Wide Project later. But uh, the Professor Hiroshi Esaki sitting in there is a director representative of a uh, wide project. But anyway, uh, today I'm gonna talk about the, uh, what the, the Japan team basically, not only the wide project is uh, talking about. And uh, can I see my slide? Can, can you control the slide please? Okay, um, so wide project has been, is a, a research consortium working for the infrastructure uh, researches on the internet technology and uh, protocols and other things for a long time. Uh, it's, uh, it's been uh, 35 years of uh, history uh, and it's uh, uh, more than 100 uh, companies. Uh, most of our companies uh, supporting us is uh, from Japan, but uh, also they are from the other part of the uh, world as well. And uh, then the universities and the engineers from the um, ISPs and the vendors, engineers. So it's a it's a very nice uh, a mixture of uh, uh, professional experts uh, on the uh, uh, network and the computation uh, background, um, I including the science and other researches. Um, so the White Project decided next slide, please, um, to to work on the submarine cable. And uh, we've been you know, kind of uh, uh, doing a uh, lot of uh, work, but uh, uh, if you heard uh, uh, Giant and uh, uh, other European activities, and uh, this is very nice that the uh, um, EU is uh, funding the research activities, and then the research activity is uh, endorsing the installing of a new submarine cable around, right? Okay, so um, then the, um, 
US uh, National Science Foundation, United States, is uh, doing the very similar thing and connecting the international cable, including the connectivity to Japan and the Europe, but also to the South, South America and the other thing. So see the US got their uh, pretty big uh, funding uh, body and uh, then the EU got the pretty big funding body uh, based on the research and uh, then endorsing the installing of a submarine cable. So uh, the point is that we don't have that in the uh, Asia Pacific region. So uh, that has been the issue. So uh, uh, various uh, entities started to work together uh, to work as Europe and America and uh, then the Asia Pacific in, uh, some of the infrastructure uh, for the research and the educational activities. That has been discussed, but the finally now uh, it's uh, uh, got into the form. Uh, go ahead. And so um, now the white project started the, uh, the things called the uh, Arena Park, Arterial Research and Educational Network in the Asia Pacific, and also working together with the other uh, funding agency of Japan and the other uh, partners uh, around the Pacific uh, to work together. So uh, then, uh, you know, it's uh, uh, creating the great collaboration to uh, connect the uh, various uh, uh, partners and then uh, on to the very strong, try to establish a strong uh, um, network infrastructure in the Asia Pacific and uh, then uh, connecting to Euro both Europe and America. So uh, if you, um, the next slide is gonna be this one. Okay, good. Okay, so we have a booth actually, and uh, then you know, asking uh, all the people visiting the booth that uh, uh, to connect to de their own research and educational network link by themselves and uh, creating uh, this uh, globe uh, with a pin and a string. And uh, so uh, if you look at this uh, in a carefree, then you know, we do have a, a very uh, important partners. And the blue one is, uh, by the way, the dream, <laughs> dreamland. So it's not there. So the Arctic fiber is uh, one of the blue line. And uh, from the Chile to uh, this side, yeah. Chile to, oh, oh, we don't have that one yet. Yeah, we have one in here. So, after this session, then please visit our, our booth and uh, you can add your dream link uh, for the, uh, anyway. But anyway, so um, that's, that's a kind of a symbolic uh, effort uh, we've been working together. So uh, this, this uh, part of the Asia Pacific is uh, not just by uh, Arena Park, which is a wide project operation, but also the Signet and the other thing. So, uh, going to the uh, oh the let me sh let me share one of the challenges uh, we started to work. I mean we are the uh, researchers of uh, networking technology as well, so uh, we have a new uh, technology called uh, LODAM, uh, reconfigurable optical add and drop multiplexer, which is uh, well known for the data center technology as well. But uh, so instead of uh, dropping the fiber and uh, then uh, going forward type of a thing, then uh, we can split the, uh, the spectrum and the dynamically reconfigurable spectrum thing. Uh, that's a, a RODAM technology, uh, which is now being uh, getting uh, pretty much standard for the data center uh, technology. But uh, that's called a dry RODAM. And uh, then you know, so uh, uh, there's gonna be a wet RODAM, which is uh, under, uh, used, used for undersea cable. So uh, that's gonna change our configure and the design of the uh, submarine cable for the dropping in the city uh, in from the uh, middle of the ocean and uh, then uh, reconfigurable for the future. So uh, remember the uh, lifetime of the optical fiber is like uh, 25 years. And uh, therefore during that 25 years, probably the uh, split to the and the dropping in the certain city, uh, traffic might be changed, and uh, then you know instead of uh, reinstalling the fiber, uh, we can do the uh, reconfigurable, uh, utilizing the existing fiber, and uh, then the control. So uh, this might be 
it's it's not there uh, for the research and the, I mean long term long haul network on the submarine cable yet. But uh, uh, we are now very eager to uh, explore this technology for the new cable, especially between the Euro Europe and Japan. So um, go ahead with the new one. So. Uh, the, if uh, uh, the Arctic fiber coming to Japan from north, which is a red line, and uh, then you know, going to south, which is uh, uh, reaching to a southeast uh, Asia, okay, and uh, then the you know, important thing is that uh, this um, connectivity for the northern cable and the southern cable uh, should be benefit for the European community to reach the southeast Asia research entity as well. Therefore, the the question is how can we drop in and uh, from uh, I mean connecting Tokyo and uh, then dropping in the Philippines and uh, uh, other cities, which is also a requirement of a EU research community as well. Okay, so next slide, please. And uh, then uh, those um, places could be a candidate of uh, installing the uh, wet rodam and uh, then the reconfigurable. Uh, for the you know the dropping in uh, Hokkaido, dropping in uh, Tokyo, dropping in uh, um, terminating in uh, Tokyo, and uh, then connecting in uh, Tokyo, and uh, then uh, reaching to the uh, Philippines and other uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, this is uh, what uh, uh, we are trying to achieve for the future. Uh, so uh, next slide, please. Uh, so so this is a yellow part. Is uh, basically the working with the Japanese government. Uh, that uh, you know, which parts going to be uh, more missing, missing ocean of the cable, and then you know, so that's going to be beneficial. That uh, because uh, most of the traffic is on the internet, internet traffic can be uh, you know the getting a benefit from uh, alternative and the complicated uh, uh, route, uh, route and the topology, right? So route topology should be complicated and the redundant. Uh, for the internet traffic, anyway. So, um, from here on, then uh, uh, the application, like a research and education, not only the scientific big researches, and the starting with uh, Keiko uh, for explaining about this Oyeja, and uh, the, huh? uh, okay, all right, all right, okay, I'm sorry. I, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna talk a little bit more. Uh, this, this, slide is uh, talking about a uh, uh, research collaboration between Asia and uh, Europe, uh, each of the uh, specific subject, and uh, including uh, fusion and uh, uh, astronomy, uh, high, high performance computing. There is a lot of uh, requirements uh, for the research community between uh, uh, Asia and uh, Europe. And uh, this is from uh, uh, one entity, uh, agency, uh, NII, and the next one is NICT. Uh, to work with uh, various entities and the research. And the, then they know the third uh, slide is uh, basically their uh, an asking their requirements for the how much bandwidth do, we, do you want? And, the, and then they said 100 gig, 500 gig. Oh, by the way, I forgot to say that the most of the, the, this string is 100 gig today and they're going up to a 400 gig for the future, so which is gonna be a, a lot of traffic. So then uh, switching to uh, re educational thing with uh, Keiko and uh, then uh, more the uh, consuming a lot of bandwidth from astronomy research from OSA. Okay. Thank you, Jun, uh, introducing me. So um, I've been working in Southeast Asia and Japan, um, education and research collaboration for three or no more, more than 20 years. So uh, we have right now uh, a lot of partners. You can see a, a red dot, maybe it's not a, a little bit blur, but red dots are our, our current partners. And we do have a Nepal, Bangl uh, this is the list from west to east. Uh, Nepal, Bangladesh, Myanmar, uh, Thailand, Cambodia, in, uh, Vietnam, Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines, Timor Leste, Japan, and uh, the most east, uh, I believe, Australia. And those are the partners, uh, not only a pinpoint university, but those are 
the gateways to their own RENs, like an NREN, BDREN, MRN. So all, e all the com countries and regions has their own universities and institutions connecting. So we are kind of gateways uh, to all the r area. The red dot, um, you can see, as you can see, uh, they are connected, uh, each other, uh, by international collaboration. So, um, who are we? Uh, are the wide project launched two um, significant projects in 1996 and uh, 2001. 1996 is the Asia Internet Interconnection Initiative. Remember when we live with a little connectivity in 1996, we had a, a big hope to connect all the universities. How can we connect the internet among universities in Asia? It was 1995, only 0.4% of the population of the world was using internet, and even smaller in Asia. And uh, they connected uh, many universities in East, uh, um, Southeast Asia utilizing satellite technology. And five years later, from AIIII, uh, we call it, uh, right-hand side is School of Internet. How can we share knowledge among universities in Asia over the internet that AIIII created? Uh, uh, that was 2001. Still, only 8.6% 8, 8 uh, of the population was using internet. So this is the beginning of our uh, pro collaboration. And at that time, um, all the universities set up the satellite to connect each other and so on and so on. So connectivity is essential for research and education, s um, even from a uh, very early stage. 2007, we have a full set of uh, partners started to work together. That was 20% of the population era. So uh, at that time, learning and research together in Asia has been a norm since the beginning. So um, yeah, we got together. We know we can do better with peers than doing ourselves. So we learned each other. Uh, you can see many countries are connecting there. And the very, very um, simple technology at that time, multicast and sa uh, satellite, and many countries connected by themselves because of the education. And Many, many things happened, and then 2019, we had almost 60% uh, of population connected, and the university are, are ready to go further, uh, uh, 2019, and then COVID came, and yes, this is the way we, we've been working together for uh, several years now, but uh, um, now uh, we got a, a cable connectivity, and we have a good harmonization of satellite and cables right now. And Arena Park that Jun uh, just talked about started to strengthen our collaboration beyond Asia. So um, you can see Tokyo is connecting to many uh, places and Singapore is connecting to many places and Guam has a new topology added by Arena Park. But um, Asia, University co uh, partners are excited about new high-speed network, which is a uh, uh, Indonesia si signing ceremony, 100 gigabps coming to Indonesia, and that is not only to Indonesia but beyond that. And Indonesia is connecting to Guam, Tokyo, but not only to, to Tokyo. Tokyo uh, beyond Tokyo uh, go into other places, uh, Europe and. Um, the Europe and the United States as well. So it's already connected, um, ready to do many more things. And we are uh, looking forward to more collaboration and that this, uh, the on the research and education. And in order to keep this environment sustainable, we really um, believe education for the internet engineers a uh, key essence to for the future. So we have our education program and now a all Asian partners, Asia-wide educational program are ongoing and we are ready for research and education collaboration beyond Asia. So I would like to pass this microphone to. Uh, thank you very much. So I'm Masafumi from Astronomical Observatory of Japan. So. 
Uh, today, I would like to talk to you about uh, how submarine cables enhance the big semi science. So, the first three, so the why we, uh, we are networks are uh, under sea, the submarine cables are uh, relevant to the astronomy. So, the, this presentation will be explained about our uh, big science facilities. So, this is a very big uh, consuming the data to analyze the uh, astronomy data. And also, I would like to introduce to impact of the network hand bandwidth on the science. So the what is now J? Now J is National Astro Astronomical Observatory Japan. So we have a lot of the uh, astronomical facilities in the world. So the, our main facility is located in the top of Mount Nakia in Hawaii. And also, uh, we are uh, make a collaborate with the ESA and the, uh, NARO in US. Uh, in the Chile, so this it's called the Aruma Atacaba Submilita Array antenna. So that is uh, the two of the current facilities are the uh, consuming the red a lot of data to the androids to the uh, to observing the uh, astronomy. So there, that is one of the example. So the Subaru telescope that is has a one 8.2 primary single meter is uh, facility. So the this uh, telescope facility is a multi-purpose use. So the, this uh, Subaru telescope has the three point of the mounting point for the attaching the some observa observation system. So the Subaru telescope established in, in 1999, the system has been upgraded year by year. So currently the uh, uh, high hyper supreme cam is the our fragment uh, flagship observation facility, one of the facilities. So this is uh, a lot of the huge amount of the data to the shot the uh, starts. So the this is a uh, lot of the high sensitive the CCD is the uh, connected to the computing facility and the storage, storage facilities. So like uh, the 870 million pixels digital camera in the top of the manager. So the all of our facility is located in the world. So one of the possible fa facilities I talked. So another one is the Aruma project. That, that first right is 2011. So this site also there are a lot of con the consuming the data to transfer to the Tokyo and the other European countries and the US, US mainland. So the, the currently the, this figure showing to the submarine cables so, but uh, that facility is not quite really different uh, actual the data network from the Aruma Subaru to the Tokyo. So, the cable planning is, submarine cable planning is uh, not relationship to the uh, some uh, location of the observation site. The ob current observation site is the best location for the uh, observing the stars. So the Next fact is the science is not possible without network technologies. So the Aruma is the one of big facilities. So uh, you show the this figure showing the Yamanote line. That is a major uh, JR line in the Tokyo area. So the each uh, parabola antenna is connected to around the size of the Yamanote line. So the fiber cable over the 60 km six kilometers away from the central data center. So uh, e each data from the uh, telescope has been transferred to the correlation office. So the all of the correlation office has a supercomputer system. So that this system facility, the engineering that analyzes the data from the each telescope. So then they're creating the images. So the currently, uh, this network has based on the 10 gigabit Ethernet. However, so the, this facility is depending on the technology of the commodity community technology, so like uh, Ethernet or so ATM or something. So the, this program will be updated the year by year. So the, firstly, so the, I'm talking about the current the, uh, astronomy facilities. With, with the net data bulk data networks, so the in last year uh, we uh, have collaborated with the Arena Park. 
the hundred gigabit ESA network reached to the Subaru telescope in the top of Mauna Kea. So the we are uh, upgrading the all of the network facility from the uh, Mauna Kea to the Tokyo. So uh, before the upgrading, so <coughs> we need to the one more weeks to analyze the uh, data. However, so the after the upgrading the 100 gigabit Ethernet network deployed, so all of the data analyzed to the uh, computing facility in Japan. So I mean that basically the Subaru telescope in 99, we just only have the one, one point, uh, 100 ATM based network. So the all of the computing analyzing uh, storage facility should be located in the Subaru. However, the currently the uh, high bandwidth network has been deployed from the Mauna Kea to the Tokyo. So mean that all of data transferred to the uh, Tokyo and uh, analyze the uh, computing facility in Tokyo. So that mean a lot of accelerate to uh, analyze the data, just only currently the on under the one, one 10 minutes. So that's a very good impact for the astronomy uh, science. So, and also the ARMA, has the currently the data transfer system, DTS system, is upgrading. So the Aruma is, uh, you know, the, uh, the uh, currently using a 10 gigabit Ethernet. However, that will be upgrading to the uh, 1.2 terabps network, so which is the based on the 400 gigabit Ethernet. So I mean that currently the we Aruma telescope has the multiple band receiver is existing the one single antenna. However, if bandwidth upgrading to the 1.2 terabps mean that all, all receiver are sending data uh, are synchronous to, <laughs> to the synchronous to the uh, data centers in the uh, Santiago. So mean the, the fiber is also the deplo deployed to the over the six kilometer away from the uh, main site to the data center facilities. So. This network improvement is improve the network functionality, open the way to the new scientific frontier. That is a very good impact for the bandwidth. So that's all from uh, me. So thank you. Uh, thank you very much um, from all three representatives from WIDE. Um, I uh, would like to open the floor if there have any questions for our three colleagues here. And I don't see anything in the chat, but as I said before, we'll have time at the end for more questions, and I have one or two up my sleeve too. But before then, um, it's my pleasure to introduce my colleague Ieva from Norginet, who's going to talk to us about the Norginet view of subsea cables. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Sorry. Thank you, Henry, for the introduction. May I have the clicker, please? <coughs> so, uh, my name is Yava Murashkena. I'm sorry for the voice. <coughs> I come from Nordnet, and uh, if someone introduced me, then I have to introduce Nordnet as well. Nordunet is a collaboration of the research and education networks of the five Nordic countries, Denmark, Iceland, Norway, Sweden, and Finland. Nordunet was established in 1985 when the five Nordic countries joined forces. And since then, Nordunet has been known to pioneer innovative solutions and push the boundaries of the technology from the beginning of history of the internet itself. The first connection between Stockholm and Princeton was uh, set up in 1988 with a capacity of 56 kilobits per second. And in 1989, Nordunes established the first open available internet outside of the US. In 1991, Nordunet was selected to operate the first root name server, and then after that, an a lot of other innovative solutions. Currently, Nordunet operates a global network that interconnects the research and education networks in the five Nordic countries and connects these uh, countries to the rest of the world. 
The high level of redundancy on the Nordics networks is ensured by using uh, the shared infrastructure as each end run in the Nordics provides spectrum for the Nordnet network itself. On global scale, Nordnet has present both in the, in the United States and Asia. Going further, today I'm, I will talk more about the global communication problems and how we foresee to improve uh, the routes and what value we can bring to the uh, green data centers up in the north and uh, how we can make an impact on the climate science and uh, pr by presenting the smart cables. Fast and reliable internet is now vital for all, par for all parts of our modern society being it private use, businesses, governments, research and education institutions. And going forward with the digital transformations, we will need the connectivity to be more resilient, more robust, bringing even more capacity to our everyday life. If we take a look at the statistics uh, and the we break down the distribution of internet traffic for the last five years, we can clearly see that the real time traffic has grown the most. It's, near, it's more than three times growth. We cannot afford to have delays in real-time traffic. It's not acceptable anymore by any user. But if we take a look uh, at the example of research and education world, in the north of Europe, Nordnet provides connectivity, uh, high-speed high connectivity to ISCAT 3D, which is the next generation international atmos atmosphere and geospace research radar. With this high-speed connectivity, we enable real-time steering and data integration between the three sites of the ISCAT 3D, each consisting of the 10,000 antenna beam forming phase array systems. In Europe, we also have connectivity to Large Hadron, Hadron Collider and CERN. And throughout other research and education networks, we have connections also to ALMA Observatory in Chile. Before many, time, uh, many years, Scientists had to wait for the dedicated time slots or several years to get access to the equipment on the network. But now, the connection needs to be up and running with 100% availability. You can imagine the pressure of delivering that through the research and education networks. I don't know if many of you in the audience know what this picture is showing. If not, the answer is a methane plume from the Nord Stream gas pipeline explosion in the Baltic Sea. My point here is, you cannot protect the cable on its whole stretch, but what you can do is build more redundancies. Multiple cables can ensure redundancy and resilience for our networks. And that's why we need to look at geographical redundancy, meaning we need to look at alternative routes. And while doing that, we must keep geopolitical situation in mind, especially if we consider the Nord Stream case or similar cases wi which disrupted the submarine cables. Now, if we take a look again at the statistics and the connectivity today, uh, we take a projection to very near future, we would see uh, that we would have doubling of the traffic between Europe and Asia to be expected and almost tripling uh, to the traffic between Europe and North America. Depending on the perspective we take, it can be a big challenge, but it also can present us as an opportunity to take action and do something about it. Now, if we look at the connectivity from the perspective of Europe, we can divide it into four major parts, four major areas. For example, Europe to North America connections. There are a lot of uh, cables connecting Europe to North America through the Atlantic Ocean, but a lot of systems are aging. And we do not know yet if there will be other systems built in time to serve the future need de and demands. Then we uh, go to Europe, Africa, and Europe, South America. The cables go outside of the coast of Africa with very limited redundancy. Connecting Asia, uh, we have a terrestrial route going across Russia. 
and due to a lot of geopolitical implication, this route is already more or less getting closed. A lot of contracts are being terminated. And then it leaves us uh, with the Suez route uh, to the Middle East uh, and, the a and Asia. Now, if we take a really closer look at the Suez, where currently 90% of the direct traffic between Europe and Asia traverses. It's a very narrow area. It's only 200 meters wide at the most narrow place. And you can imagine the congestion of the submarine cables there. It's basically a cable every 20 meters. And over this area, 1,500 trips pass every month. You can imagine there's danger. And to the challenges that I just mentioned, we can offer one solution if we take the Earth from the North Pole perspective and look at the route opportunities from the Arctic. We can see that we can build the additional redundancy or create complementary routes to the existing uh, Suez Canal area connections by adding submarine cables over the Arctic Ocean. It would be a fast track between Europe and Asia, as it is the shortest possible route. It would strengthen the, the digital sovereign sovereignty and uh, of the involved regions. The route also avoids geopolitical considerations, as it would go through exclusive economic zones of Norway, Denmark, Canada, US, and then traverse to Japan. But then you might ask, why are the Nordics involved? The Arctic connectivity would also increase the accessibility of the green data center industry in the far north. There we have a lot of uh, local excess energy from renewable energy sources, but due to lack of power infrastructure, there are limitations of how much uh, energy you can transfer from north to south. Additionally, there is a relatively high cost of transferring er energy in large distances. Therefore, moving data is much more efficient and cheaper than moving energy. In addition to this, we are where we have really cooler climate in the north, we can utilize the free cooling. We don't need air conditioning uh, to cool the data centers. And we can reuse the excessive heat from them to the nearby communities. And also, if we land high-speed connectivity in the northern areas, we can create work opportunities and prevent young talents from re leaving northern communities from coastal areas of the Nordic countries. And all of these things combined, we create the Polar Connect Vision 2030, where Polar Connect is an initiative led by Nordnet to obtain secure and resilient connectivity through the Arctic to Asia and North America, where we see submarine cables over the Arctic adding a digital routes uh, from Europe. They improve uh, the digital resilience and autonomy in the global no network. They can create a ring structure of two or more cables traversing the Arctic Ocean. Here in this vision, we see Polar Connect, a more direct route passing under the ice cap of North Pole in the Arctic Ocean, just north of Greenland uh, by exclusive economic zones and then traversing to Asia. The other one, uh, the yellow one, is Far North Fiber, a route passing through Northwest Passage of Greenland and then to North America through Bering Strait and uh, then to Japan. Far North Fiber project is more advanced. It's uh, way ahead of us. It's scheduled to be in service in 2027, with the total distance of the submarine cable being 14,500 uh, kilometers where Polar Connect project aims to be in service uh, around 2030, with a total distance of 11,000 kilometers. A lot of questions can be raised from this vision, and one of them, is it doable? And we are working really hard to answer these questions. We are working together with the Swedish Polar Research Secretariat to find a way uh, if this is viable to cross the Arctic Ocean with the submarine cable? And the answer is yes. Their knowledge, uh, they shared the knowledge from their previous Arctic expedition. Uh, it was the Arctic Coring Expedition in 2004, uh, 
with a drill ship Vilar Viking and the two icebreakers Orden and Sovietsky Soyuz, they were able to cross uh, the Arctic Ocean and do the expedition. So in essence, to be able uh, to build the submarine cr cable over the Arctic, we need two icebreaker ships and one cable laying vessel. With this approach, we can cross the Arctic Ocean and put a submarine cable there. We, so while Sweden has one icebreaker, the government is already in the discussions about building a second icebreaker of the highest polar class, comparable to the Russian one you see here. And uh, with the preparations, we see it being ready by 2030. Additionally, uh, for the submarine cable, we need to have information about the seabed of the ocean. Where Arctic Ocean is largely unexplored territory, especially for intercontinental subsea cables, but it offers dramatic advantages for all us all. So we must investigate the seabed. So we are working together with Professor Martin Jakobson from the Stockholm University and uh, his project, International Bathymetric Chart of the Arctic Ocean, where the project is helping us to gather the information of on what's openly available about the seabed of the Arctic Oceans. So the initiative of this project is to develop a digital database that contains all available bathymetric data north of 64 degrees north uh, to be used by map, map, map makers, researchers, institutions, and others who work requires a detailed and accurate knowledge of the depth of and shape of the Arctic seabed, including our submarine cable. So what we see in this image is about 24% of the Arctic seafloor that is already mapped. And we will continue to work with this project to improve this map and fill out the gaps. We aim that the uh, seabed data will be available uh, and used to identify the potential route of the Arctic connectivity. And it will contribute further for us to de-risk the project and uh, contribute to the cable survey. So as you can see, Arctic connectivity can bring broader economic benefits for the productivity trade and our all consumer welfare. It will be the shortest route from Europe to uh, East Asia, safeguarding the minimal delay time. But also submarine cables can serve as scientific instruments for earth observation, marine and seismic research. Traditionally, we have scientists uh, making measurements in the Arctic Ocean by dropping various instruments from icebreakers into the Arctic Ocean. They either take uh, instant measurements or they are left to float and take measurements over time. But there are a lot of challenges. A lot of things can go wrong in the Arctic. Sometimes the instruments are lost and recovered, sometimes never recovered. This is where fiber sensing comes into play we can enable submarine fiber cables be used as sensors by equipping them with uh, distributed acoustic sensing or state of polarization technology. Apart from that, we also uh, are familiar with the smart cable concept where, sm where fiber cables can be equipped with various sensors and can act like monitors under the sea. They can measure temperature, pressure, velocity, salinity, and together with the vibrations and acoustic sens uh, sensors can provide a very wide scope of observations around the cable. They can, they can also present near real-time data to be used by scientists. And this data can be used to improve forecasting mo models. It can be used to monitor climate change, ocean heat circulation. It can support us uh, while monitoring from natural disaster warning systems like uh, earthquakes or tsunamis. It can also help us understand marine mammal ecosystems better. The measurements will be continuous and over a long time, so and scientists will have access to this data. Also, fiber sensing can help us protect and monitor the cables themselves. So a lot of benefits on the scientific angles, which are really important, as this was not possible before. In addition to that, there's currently a lot of political momentum for the Arctic connectivity, as expressed by Margrethe Vestager, the executive vice president of Europe Fit for the Digital Age. 
In addition to that, in July, there was a memorandum of cooperation signed between uh, European Union and Japan, an MOC on submarine cables for secure, resilient, and sustainable global development. And this mock states that the Arctic route presents the potential to be expanded to wider European and Asian regions and to the Atlantic and the Pacific areas. And to realize this advantage, MOC expresses, expresses a shared intention to explore and facilitate joint and respective support action as appropriate on transoceanic submarine cables, such as awareness raising, financial supports, demand aggregation, and as appropriate facilitating relevant administrative processes. This was a joint statement by the President of European Council, Charles Michel, President of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, and Prime Minister Kishida Fumio from Japan. And they met in Brussels and communicated this jointly. And with this positive note on multinational collaboration on submarine cables, I end my presentation. If you would like to know more, uh, we have a value proposition of submarine cables a report uh, by done by Copenhagen Economics. And also you can find a lot more information about uh, Polar Connect Initiative under this QR code. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Eva. I had no idea that 90% of European traffic to Asia was at its narrowest point 200 meters wide. That was quite an eye opener for me. Um, does anyone in the audience have any questions for Eva? Or any in the chat? Um, I have some questions of my own, but I should also expand it to all of the speakers here, including Paul online, if anybody had any further questions. Please, um, I think that microphone should be working. Thanks. I need it because I'm losing my voice. Um, <laughs> nothing to do with karaoke. Um, <coughs> I did actually have a question for um, Eva um, about the... Um, cost of transferring energy versus data that you mentioned. Is there any um, reports or um, research you could uh, so point to for the There figures? is a, l a lot of res research done in that uh, value proposition in the report. Uh, we did investigate that. Uh, but it's due to lack of infrastructure or the costs for actually transferring okay. the power. So you can, I can share the report with you and uh, we can discuss it. Great, thank you. Thank you. Um, any further questions? Um, well, then I'll rattle off a few of my own. Um, I'd actually like to, I might start online with, uh, with Paul, because he's uh, uh, staying up very late in the UK to be with us here, so I'm very, very happy that he is. Um, Paul, you mentioned in your presentation um, the Bella project, and you were a big part in making that happen between uh, Géant, Redclar, and the EC. Um, I'd just like to know or see your perspective on what would you say were was the highest challenge in actually bringing together those stakeholders in an R&E context in order to make uh, Bella happen? I think... Uh First, you had the challenge of it being a pathfinder. Um, in our global community, uh, NRENs haven't had a lot of experience in investing in um, submarine cables at their inception, at the build date. They tend to procure from a more established market. So there was working in, in a new space with different ways of working. And then um, being a publicly funded body comes with certain uh, requirements for compliance, governance, and how the money was spent. And that was sometimes at odds with the way the telecommunications industry works. So trying to find a, a common way of working that satisfies everybody's obligations uh, was a challenge. Um, we were carrying out the project as well um, during some difficult times in the world's economy with Latin America, particularly as well, uh, and Brazil. So ensuring funding was available. Um, there were there were challenges throughout the project. Um, so I don't think I have one particular one that rises above all of the others, um, but these submarine cable systems are 
big pieces of heavy engineering, um, taking lots of resources, uh, complexity to design, construct and build. Um, so there are many moving parts. There's, it's, not a, it's not a simple uh, project. Thank you, Paul. Um, no, it doesn't. I remember at the time, it of course, wasn't an, an easy one to get over the line as such, but it did work and it was a success. Um, Jun, I liked your slides um, and a part which struck me especially because I'm like more from a public affairs policy point of view was you showed the different political agreements on the different projects um, between Europe, other countries, and you, you were show, showing the, like, the multi-stakeholders of uh, these, these different areas. And I was wondering, um, with your experience, what has been, in your view, the more successful projects that have had multiple member states or, or nations uh, collaborating together? And what do you think were the reasons that made them a success? Well, <coughs> that's, a, that's a great question. Um, it's uh, you know the you know this is I mean thirty thirty years is a long time, and the, then you know so it's always a uh, um, different different interest different uh, funding could be up, up available for the you know creating the future of the kind of uh, uh, fiber networking and other things. So um, uh, one time it was uh, very much uh, you know kind of satellite uh, transponder. Uh, company uh, was uh, exploring the way for the you know uh, the allocating the spectrum, so uh, they wanted to work together, and the therefore the you know kind of uh, their transponder is uh, uh, how do we say that uh, in time uh, to to work together with right, and uh, then the uh, also the uh, you know submarine cable itself is not that uh, a particular thing, but the all the high speed switches. And the uh, equipment uh, is going to be, uh, you know, co so the vendor started to uh, create the new um, uh, high-speed switch from, uh, you know, kind of uh, say uh, whatever the 10 gig to 100 gig. They wa they really wanted to test that in with uh, interoperability and other things. So uh, multiple companies working together with us uh, for the exploring the um, the interoperability testing and the other thing. So. These are the uh, research network uh, mission that they're working together. So uh, that's uh, one of the reasons I uh, intentionally introducing today about the Lodum type of uh, challenges so that the, uh, probably the new, new, new generation of the optical submarine cable control might be achieved working together with those people. And uh, then uh, they want to test that, and that we want to test that. And uh, therefore, the probably uh, it's a kind of mutual benefit uh, to work together. Uh, from the point of view of uh, investment to the new technology, it's a very, ex could be very expensive, but uh, then for the testing purpose and the other thing, then it's a kind of a mutual benefit without uh, you know, actually paying. So I said the in kind, right? So this is a testing, therefore they bring the equipment and they're working together. So uh, so it's a varied uh, for the time by time that the how that uh, uh, research type of a funding could be benefit for the real operation of the uh, creating the network. So that's a white project, probably characteristic in the world, right? So we are always, <laughs> exploring the new technology so that uh, um, probably the fundraising uh, is not that high, but uh, we can challenge the new things. So that's a model of the white project. But it, it reminds me, if you're working with these actors and you're, you're talking about in-kind contributions, that's very similar to reciprocity between NRENs when we make agreements in such a sense. Okay. Oh, oh by the way, I, I forgot the very important thing uh, during uh, our presentation uh, to to all of the European side of the people. So the talking about Southeast Asia connectivity for the researchers, that was uh, uh, initiated by what Keiko mentioned, like I in the utilizing a satellite, but uh, I really, uh, we, we, should, we should note that the 10 efforts to connect them, mm -hmm. 
is uh, very, very, very much uh, you know, the next generation of uh, terrestrial uh, connectivity to Southeast Asia, collaboration with the uh, EU and the GEN. And uh, then, uh, then now uh, we are uh, working together for the new generation, <laughs> I mean, utilizing your uh, Arctic Ocean or the uh, de uh, thinking, redesigning the uh, southern uh, connectivity as well. So uh, that's basically the phase one. It's going to be uh, by satellite. Phase two going to be by ten, and the phase three we are talking about those those historical uh, things uh, should be mentioned clearly by me or Keiko. But I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> T-E-I-N and Trans-Eurasia Information Network, um, the initiative supported by EU to connect ITC ICT infrastructure between Asia and Europe a uh, long time ago. But uh, we, we now TAIN is phase four, and uh, that strongly supported uh, the not only U EU to Asia, but um, Pan-Asia connectivity. Um, basically, Singapore-centered uh, uh, connectivity, right? Yes. Of course, uh, but still there, of course. It's th seems a long time ago. Okay, thank you. Oh, if I ask just a simple question, um, when was the first iteration of Tain? Um, do you do you remember when it began? Because Tain is like the géant version. It's the regional network of Southeast Asia. Yeah, that's so a question to you, actually. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, or, or Paul. Paul, Paul knows about the exact uh, year when it's... In the 80s. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the yeah, but the ca cable CA1 started uh, later. Uh, Probably middle 90s, I believe. Okay. Thank you very much. I mean, it just also goes to show that um, NRENs and regional networks were really uh, pioneers at the beginning um, of the boom of the internet. And I, for one, am honored to have so many colleagues who were there at that point. Um, I would like, I saw a few people come in. I'd just like to open the floor for any final questions. Um, to our guests, yes, um, microphone here or, okay, thank you so much. Good morning, everybody. My name is uh, Bjorn Rönning. I'm representing the data Norwegian data center community, uh, i.e. the commercial part of a potential problem uh, projects. So uh, my first question is uh, endorsements by governments, but I think the reason for asking is, uh, I guess this is uh, going to be an extremely costly project. So already been mentioned that you have to commission a new icebreaker <laughs> just to get get this over there. But that can probably be repurposed to other tasks than cable deployment and, and cable maintenance. Um, so obviously, I think, and um, I consider this project to be too much of a heavy lift for only for the entrance. But no offense by no means, but I think that there sh should be, we should probably expect that you have some governmental funding or you need to have a, uh, a common uh, Nordic or even European uh, and also on, a, on the Asian side and a Japanese common understanding and agreement on, on how to fund this project. Um, because then there all also has to be done some financial viability on the return of investments. So how much is how much is, uh, um, um, how much is one um, willing to, to sacrifice uh, for returns on investment, worst case? I don't know if I made myself clear or if I should probably dive into details. No, I, I have my own thoughts on it, but it's for Jun or Oyeva oh. to, or Paul to, to answer this. Yeah, Paul's uh, got I, his I think you are right. I mean. So, uh, you know, yeah, I, I was going to explain a little bit more on that, that part, but, uh, you know, the, the research and the educational network contribution for the, you know, kind of investment is uh, just, uh, you know, probably, uh, you know, the 10% or 5% of the actual in installation cost, I believe. But the important thing is that for the uh, Nordinet and ourselves, 
uh, from the both sides that uh, you know the cable company pr uh, had a plan, and uh, then you know we kind of uh, uh, generated a letter of uh, interest uh, from uh, both sides that uh, once it's installed, then uh, we're gonna occupy like uh, you know kind of uh, five percent of the capacity uh, on fiber pair entire for the research and education of uh, community. So. Um, that might be possible. It's not that easy, but the fundraising for the research and education for five percent of the uh, entire cable installation, right? And the other part, of course, uh, need to be uh, you know kind of uh, um, uh, in investment has to coming from the commercial or the public entity, uh, other than research and educational purposes. So. Uh, this is not that easy. So uh, in the past, then uh, you know a number of uh, projects failed because of uh, the lack of the you know con consortium building uh, was not successfully done uh, to to uh, raise enough uh, funding. Uh, but um, so for this one, uh, we kind of uh, did uh, uh, very special approaches. Uh, different than the past on uh, you know other part of the cable, which is. Uh, uh, the um, the uh, which one uh, the poll explained about the EU Japan uh, digital partnership agreement, which is a uh, very much a uh, public entity endorsing that, that this is going to be needed for not only for the research and educational scientific one, but the, all the economy of the both end. So that is the way that uh, uh, I, I don't think a government can raise, support the commercial activities. I don't believe that, but they can, they can endorse. That means, uh, you know, the Japanese government, frankly, already started to communicate with the uh, uh, economy industries that, uh, and the financial industry that uh, you're gonna get the benefit of uh, this cable. If that is the case, then you have opportunity to invest. Uh, for the uh, optical fiber because this is special. So that kind of a promotion already uh, supported by the government in Japan already. So this is a, a additional uh, endorsement type of efforts from the public, uh, uh, I mean government side. So I think this is good that, uh, I, and, and I don't remember this has been done in the past on the history. So the, the EU-Japan Digital Partnership Agreement uh, is uh, now uh, extending the the kind of uh, uh, industry and the scope of the people and the stakeholders to be involved for the supporting the industry. So the research and the educational actually initiated that kind of thing. So so Nordinet and ourselves said we want this cable, and uh, this might be. So so we kind of uh, started the efforts and uh, then. Uh, uh, inviting the other other stakeholders to be involved. So uh, this is a very special way, I believe. But uh, what what do you think? Uh? Yeah, I, I agree everything you said. And uh, from the Nordic's perspective, of course, we need to engage with the Nordic ministries and governments to get their support and endorsement, equally like in Japan. But apart from the governments, we also engage with the European Commission to ensure that there's relevant support from their side to ensure also the funding opportunities that we can explore to have the conversation with them as well because they also made some promises. We also contribute to the goals uh, they are expecting us to deliver on. And we benefit from the unique position we have from the research and education point. We can talk to them all and also engage with the commercial side. And that partnership with Japan and having connections to Japan also helps to communicate our message even further and for them to communicate it back so that both ends of the connectivity are engaged. And we create this multiple use cases uh, to have the arguments that we really need such infrastructure on our end. It's not just the connectivity that we talk about. We talk about much more benefits added on top of simple submarine cable. So I think there's there's good progress. And we're also working on de-risking the project for the commercial side, so to make them a little bit more attracted to the idea. Uh, we're working on building the business cases, exp exploring the opportunities there. So it's not just that we talk, but we also do the work, the seabed survey, the 
the resources we need to for actually building the cable, but to know when they will be available so we can make use of them. So I think there's there's good progress. Thank you. Thanks, Siova. Um, Paul, did you still want to answer before I move on to the next question? I think a lot of the uh, the good points have been made there. I would just reinforce the point. Um, yeah. We've got some experience of doing this now um, in the Bella case study I gave as an example. So in the Mediterranean with the Medusa system recently, and in both of those instances, as Yeva and Jun have said, it's about a collaboration of partnerships. So the, the question from the floor there is absolutely right that NRENs alone can't deliver this, um, whether it's the, the financial investment, the skills, the expertise, the resources, uh, yeah, the, there's government, there's funding bodies, there's the user communities, the skills that we have within NRENs, you know, as, as we explained that the history of the internet comes from our community. So we're, we're pretty good at building networks, um, but the, the heavy lifting of, of actually implementing a, a submarine cable, we work closely with, with commercial partners. Um, and I'd like to say that I think we're quite desirable partners there. Uh, Yeva used the term there around de-risking uh, with public funds and our use case supporting research and education. We're a a good partner to have on board um, to, to enable a project to, to progress. Thanks, Hendrik. Thank you very much. Paul. Um, I think we have another question from the audience. I'm wondering if part of the story then is also a security and resilience one, if you're looking at it from a government perspective. So from one side, you've got the ability to pump time down this, so you've got a GPS type of uh, solution there. But then what is the cost of disaster recovery after an event? So if you can predict, predict tsunamis, for example, if you can predict earthquakes, surely that has a very strong business case. So we're working with the likes of Google and British Telecom at the moment to test some of these. And of course, all of these companies are looking for new revenue streams and new services and products. So I think that is part of the story as well. And I'd welcome your thoughts on that. Thank you. Anyone want to take that, that up? You have a well, um, yeah, probably that is a, a little bit different from the uh, maybe, uh, you know, uh, following me, uh, probably smart cable concept uh, should be explained from an audience side. Uh, but uh, then uh, in Japan, uh, we've been, you know, suffered with the earthquake very much. And uh, then, you know, so uh, the smart cable concept is uh, like, uh, you know, um, piggybacking a sensors on a commercial communication cable, right? But the that is not enough for Japan. And uh, therefore, the, uh, the National Laboratory of Earthquake Seismic Study uh, had uh, uh, its own uh, collaboration with a cable company for the you know, specific uh, uh, type of uh, sensors to be installed. So uh, historically, we started from the, uh, well, expired communication cable and the putting the sensor and uh, for the you know kind of uh, detecting the uh, earthquake or the uh, mitigation for the earthquake type of a thing, but uh, now it's a kind of a very much uh, um, the we we now identify that this area of ocean is going to be a very I mean bottom of the ocean is going to be very dangerous. Therefore, uh, we have a very specific uh, installation uh, of the sensor cable, uh, so the it's its own uh, purposes as well. So uh, uh, it's a very serious in this country. <laughs> so uh, and uh, so um, the meaning that separate funding for the you know kind of a co commercial companies funding and the uh, research and the educational traffic funding and uh, uh, seismic funding uh, uh, a little bit different funding possible in Japan because of the frequency of the earthquake. Anyone like to add? Uh, just a little comment. So last week we, as Nordunet, had uh, a science engagement workshop. Uh, we engage with the scientists and look uh, what kind of opportunities they want to see on the submarine cables. And there's a lot of good uh, conversations, but there's also an understanding of how different the commercial companies want to use the cables and the how different it is for the scientists what they want. They want accuracy. They want a lot of information. So alone, the submarine cable cannot replace other research instruments, but it can contribute highly to early warning or just, hey, look, something is happening at that end. Maybe you want to look more closely, that kind type of information, but not 
be the main source of seismicity or other types of uh, natural disasters. But we can contribute to the scientific research. We can bring the information to the table, but not be the main source of it. So we need to kind of distribute the expectations a little bit. <laughs> but it's really insightful to talk to the scientists. They have really good comments. Thank you. Thank you, Eva. Um, are there any further questions? No, I don't see any in the chat. Well, I think with that, I will close the session. Um, I'd really like to thank everybody who presented today and who attended from remotely across the world and for those of you who turned up for this session this morning. Um, it's been an eye-opener for me and I very much appreciate everyone's input. So thank you so much. And um, enjoy your coffees. <laughs> Goodbye. Thank you very much. Have a good day all. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. And the audience, please visit our booth after that. <laughs> then, then you can you can touch and you can you can install your your dream to theirs.